Pyridine is an extremely useful reagent in organic chemistry that just so happens to be one of the most unpleasant things I've ever smelled. In the chemistry lab, pyridine is used to synthesize a variety of pesticides and pharmaceuticals. For those who can tolerate its foul odor, it can also be used as a polar, basic, and minimally reactive solvent. Pyridine can also be used to produce a few interesting organometallic complexes, including a fluorescent complex with monovalent copper and an octahedral complex with trivalent cobalt. I plan to use pyridine to make both of these chemicals along with a few others. Now to make some pyridine, I only needed two chemicals, niacin and copper chromite. The pyridine will be produced by the decarboxylation of niacin with copper chromite acting as a catalyst. While niacin can be easily purchased anywhere online, I had to make the copper chromite myself, which I did in a video a few weeks back. If making copper chromite looks like too much work, other copper compounds such as copper carbonate or copper oxide can be used instead. The only problem with these is that they're a lot harder to recover or reuse, and from what I've seen, they tend to result in significantly lower yields. Regardless, the first step in making pyridine is to grind together the niacin with your catalyst of choice. I used 62 grams of niacin and 20 grams of copper chromite, and to make sure they were thoroughly mixed, I decided to combine the two in a blender rather than a mortar. Once I felt these two were as evenly incorporated as they were going to get, I poured the mixture into a 250 milliliter round bottom boiling flask and set it up for a basic distillation. At this point, I slowly ramped up the heat to around 115 degrees Celsius, at which point white vapors that I assume were mostly water began to come through the column. I continued heating to 130 degrees Celsius, at which point the niacin began to visibly melt and decarboxylate. After a little while longer, pyridine began to evaporate from the solid mass and distill over as a relatively clear liquid. What's happening here is a basic decarboxylation catalyzed by solid divalent copper. To put it even more simply, this is basically just an intentional thermal decomposition that produces pyridine and carbon dioxide. Seeing as that carbon dioxide is a gas, it will simply leave the system through the open vacuum port while pyridine will distill over above its boiling point of 115 degrees Celsius. However, this reaction is by no means perfect and darkly colored byproducts will almost always be formed, especially at higher temperatures. I'm nearly certain this is why the yield is so much lower if you use anything but copper chromite as a catalyst, since from what I've read the reaction is typically conducted at a much higher temperature when other catalysts are used. Anyway, the distillation was continued for a little over an hour until the pyridine distilling over was somewhat yellow and the reaction had slowed to a crawl. At this point, I went ahead and cut the heat, transferred my pyridine to a larger flask, and then added a few grams of potassium hydroxide. The potassium hydroxide will work to effectively pull any water out of the crude pyridine, and to give this enough time to happen, I went ahead and let the flask sit overnight. When I came back the next day, I filtered the crude and now very dry pyridine through a coffee filter to remove the solid potassium hydroxide. The receiving flask here was a small boiling flask, which I immediately set up for a short path distillation to redistill the very impure pyridine. To do this, I simply cranked up the heat and collected anything that distilled over between 114 and 117 degrees Celsius. I don't really think much of anything distilled over outside of this range anyway, but if anything did, it would need to be discarded as waste. Once the distillation was complete, I weighed out my pure pyridine for a final mass of 38.08 grams, representing a very high 96% yield. This number seems almost too high, and either this went perfectly, or I failed to dry the pyridine completely. Regardless, the final product is more than pure enough for my purposes, and given the overwhelmingly putrid odor of this stuff, I decided to not bother with any further processing. If you're interested in my take on this notoriously horrid smelling chemical, I honestly have to say this isn't the absolute worst thing I've ever smelled. While it certainly smells worse than putrescine or cadaverine, it isn't nearly as bad as sulfur chlorides or thiols. It does smell a bit worse than methylamine, but to me it's less that it's the worst smell in the world and more that it smells like something I really should not be smelling, um, if that makes any sense. It's something of a visceral, almost primordial repulsion that I also get from smelling phenol or aniline, but to an even greater extent with pyridine. Anyway, that's basically the whole process, and in general, decarboxylations aren't too tough. As I said earlier, I plan to use this stuff to make a few organometallic complexes, so check back in a few weeks if that's something you'd like to see. 
Now before I wrap this up, I wanted to talk about a few of the projects I'm working on and explain why my uploads have been kind of spotty lately. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, I moved recently and my new lab space is significantly larger and much better lit than my old one. In the long run, this is obviously a fantastic development. However, the footage I'm getting now is so much better than it was just a few months ago that I've been getting really inside my own head about releasing footage that I feel really isn't up to par anymore. As a result, I've been spending a lot of time lately refilming parts of old projects or completely refilming the entire thing. It's also given me a lot of time to think about different ways I could present my videos here and different types of videos I could be making, and I've got a lot of ideas. I'll go ahead and throw the main ideas I have up on screen, and you can pause and read them if you're interested. Let me know in the comments if any of these seem interesting to you, I'll uh, read through them and it'll definitely influence what I decide to do over the next few months. With that, I hope you found this interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my wonderful patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very, very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.